Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. So how'd the first week of Providence go, Dave? It was great. Yeah, it was great to have students back here. A real hot week, over 100 here in Pasadena. Wow. But, uh, yeah, they came back last Saturday and and have settled in, and I think they're real happy uh, to to see one another. So it uh, bodes well for the beginning of the year, and I think a lot of a lot of students, if they can, are really uh, enjoying uh, being back with one another. So uh, things felt uh, somewhat normal this week. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it was my first day back at uh, King's in over five months. We were back there for faculty conference. We were still about three weeks before we start classes, but that was, it was good. Good to see everybody and back in those familiar places, get back in my office, the books that I've been wishing I had access to all those months. And yeah, I think it feels like there's a little bit of normalcy that's, that's coming back, but then there's other parts of it as everybody's got their mask and everybody's trying to keep their distance and just the whole second level of COVID awareness that, that reminds you well, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, we actually bought these uh, wristbands to uh, show where we are, green, blue, orange, or red, uh, to signal to people how comfortable or um, uncomfortable we are around others. But, well, you know, it's, a, it's mm. a, a strange time when you're looking forward to going to a faculty staff in service to see other people. <laughs> so. We've uh, completed our required watching or reading of the Democratic National Convention four nights as predicted, it was it was tough for me. Honestly, I was I was dragging by the end of it trying to watch. I don't think I've watched a convention like that in a number of cycles. You know, my usual method is read the transcript the next morning. But I I, I wanted to try to take in the prime time event and and kind of get a feel for all that. So what we're going to do today is do a kind of day by day review of the convention and talk through some of the major themes on a big picture. And then, as we always do, take that step back with our required reading to try to understand the basic context, intellectual, philosophical context of that convention through the lens of some early progressive writings. And as we see, really the mainstreaming of progressivism, that's one of the major themes of the last dozen years, I think it's fair to say, going back to the beginning of the Obama administration. But, but really, even in this last campaign, you see how progressivism and some of the ideas that, as Bernie Sanders himself said, were, were seen as radical, have, have become mainstream, have become part of the normal way of speaking and the kinds of policies that are expected by a large swath of the Democratic Party. And so we're going to talk about that, make those connections between those historical antecedents and what we saw this week. A uh, quick reminder before we get into the headlines and that review of the convention, we are on Instagram, Democracy in America Today. If you were on there this week, you got a chance to play acceptance speech bingo with us, and you probably know by now that Dave got a bingo. He nailed it. He, he borrowed words from the slogan for the, for the convention, so it, it, it gave him a leg up, but hey, good research. You got to give credit where credit's due. So we'll see if we can do as well next week. All right. So let's, let's talk about some of the big themes that came out of the convention. Uh, I think, you know, for my viewing, my perspective, and I'm we're focusing on the major speeches of, of kind of the major leaders of, of the party. It seemed to me that the basic case against Trump uh, was, was twofold. Uh, number one, a case against his character that he's divisive and unseriousness, uh, unserious, that he's essentially still in a reality show starring himself. And where he does engage, he does so in a way that divides people rather than bringing people together versus good old empathetic Joe. And then the second branch of the case against President Trump was, was competence. Basically, the narrative was that... President Obama, Vice President Biden teed things up. They got the economy going again. They took care of health care. They had the world in order, Iran deal, climate change, 
was on a glide path to being taken care of. And then comes Donald Trump and he messed everything up. And of course, his response to COVID-19 adds X layers on top of that. And so now Joe Biden has to come off the sidelines to fix the problems that he's already fixed once. And now it's time to do it again because of the incompetence of Donald Trump. Yeah. And I might add that part of the argument against Trump is that he doesn't rely upon experts when he should. And it's not necessarily Joe who's going to fix things on his own. It's just that uh, they have that uh, Obama command center, all of the the brilliant people uh, who uh, have served in government before. And and Joe's just going to trust them again. And and when we trust government again, uh, we're going to be able to right the ship. Hashtag science. So, Character and competence, right? Over and over again, those are the two things that that are brought as charges against President Trump. And, you know, as we were talking before the show about the the discipline, I think you saw on display from people that, you know, had some real significant differences. You've got different wings of the party represented in these major primetime speeches, but they were on message. They were on message. And there were a cluster of issues that they kept going back to. And, and they had a way of bringing what was, if you thought about it, a really strong set of charges against President Trump, and yet somehow doing it without maybe people noticing that that was quite what they were doing. Right? So, so democracy is at stake. Wow, that, that's a really big deal <laughs> to say democracy is at stake. Democracy is on the ballot. Wow, that's a major claim to say my opponent doesn't believe in democracy or the basic rules of the game. And yet they were able to pull that off, it seemed, in a way that seemed kind of folksy. Yeah, if you go, as we will, through these six to eight main speeches, it's amazing how often you'll see our country, our nation, the United States. uh, They really did pull it off very well. The whole thing was choreographed in a way where... Uh, you do get a sense that uh, there is something that is being lost here that that um, that they unitedly want to um, return to, and they're not uh, they're not uh, angry, which is so much of you know what we've seen uh, in uh, some of the protests gone amok. That that wasn't on display at all uh, in in this convention. So I I thought they did a really good job kind of keeping things together, keeping things clean, keeping things positive, even though, as you mentioned, uh, they were making some significant charges against uh, President Trump. Yeah, I mean, if you follow the logic of the arguments, if you don't vote for Joe Biden, you will lose democracy, you will lose your life, you will lose your livelihood, and you will lose your future, right? So in that sense, the stakes couldn't be higher, but I think just as you're saying, rather than presenting that in an angry way, but it was, it was that more in sorrow than in anger. I'm not angry, I'm disappointed. And that, was, that was the tone. You had that in Hillary Clinton as she was saying how much she wished Donald Trump would have succeeded, but it just didn't happen. And Barack Obama, the same. I knew he wouldn't follow through on my policies, but I thought, I hoped he would do things in a decent way, that he would be a somebody who would grow into the office, right? That was the kind of language there. And so it was sort of the, the parent who's disappointed in the child rather than the taskmaster who's, who's ready to really bring down the hammer. I, incredibly sincere. I, I just, uh, just so sincere and authentic. And, but um, in all seriousness, uh, you see the tie here uh, between the, the experts are going to solve the problem and the dope who came into the office four years ago and the dopes who voted for him are making things worse, even though like a good parent talking to a child, we would hope that they would have been more responsible when we left for the weekend and left the house to them. So let's work our way through the four evenings and we're going to focus on the major speeches. Let's start with Monday night. We have Bernie Sanders and Michelle Obama, the two major primetime addresses. I thought Sanders, I mean, Sanders was, it was, it was a classic Sanders speech. It was the one speech where we got to look underneath the hood and see what kind of car we're really driving, right? We heard a lot about good old Joe, but there was not a lot about policies. And Sanders was the one speech where 
you didn't get into a lot of specifics, but you got a sense of the, the tone of the overall policy direction. When he emphasized, once again, that those policies that were considered, and he, he does the air quotes, radical, are now mainstream. And that, that's, that's the policy program. And there's something that seemed to happen there, you know, the kind of a deal between the progressive wing and the, the ones that want to make sure they win the election. So look, you, you give us the platform, we'll let you have the convention. But I thought, you know, his was the speech that kind of went against type and in some ways became refreshing as you went along because all the rest of them seemed like they were written by the same, the same group of writers, you know, hit the same phrases, hit the same charges. Sanders got to, got to be Sanders still. Yeah, you had to add in an, our nation, our country, our democracy. So he had maybe five or six of those. But yeah, he did get into sp- some specifics and specifics were very much lacking throughout the convention. Joe supports raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, this will give 40 million workers a pay raise. How it's going to be paid for? Well, that's another question. Joe will also make it easier for workers to join unions, create 12 weeks of paid family leave, fund universal pre-K for three and four-year-olds, and might make childcare affordable for millions. Uh, Joe will spend money on infrastructure. Joe will uh, reduce the or lower the eligibility age of Medicare from 65 to 60. So here are some you know, very kind of progressive policies that, that would be very expensive, but uh, there's some flesh uh, to the speech. There, there are some directives that are given. This is what you can expect uh, if you vote for Joe. Yeah, I think he was actually the, the speech that was the most in kind of that attack dog mode. We were thinking uh, Kamala Harris might might take on, which she really didn't in her speech, but he was the one that kept using Trump over and over again, uh, eight times. He t- Trump did this, Trump will do that, uh, versus Joe. All right, how about Michelle Obama? Let's let's now talk about her speech, the one that wrapped up Monday evening. And this is the speech that really introduced what turned out to be the major theme in terms of what we wanted to say about Joe Biden, namely a focus on his empathy. Uh, that was the dominant word in Michelle Obama's speech. I thought it was very effectively delivered. Uh, I think, again, this like more in sorrow than in anger. Nobody captured that better than she did. She doesn't even want to be involved in politics. She hates politics. Somehow she keeps getting dragged into conventions and being first lady and all the rest. But, but she hates politics, but she loves her country. And so here we go again, because the people that are supposed to do this job aren't doing it well. They don't care. Everyone can be empathetic. We teach it to our children. It's easy to be empathetic. And somehow we have a president who's not. Yeah, I likewise thought that the speech was, was a, a well-crafted. I think that the theme that, that I saw over and over again in all these speeches is, you know, what is the story of America? Uh, we who are of the Democratic Party, we who have a progressive mindset, we're not rejecting the story of America. We want to embrace it but we want to embrace it to its full realization, a realization that's been taken off course in the last four years by this awful incompetent man. So let's shift to Tuesday night. I think we can move pretty quickly through the two major speeches there. We've got Bill Clinton and Dr. Jill Biden. Uh, we, had, we had asked the question whether Bill Clinton would apologize for anything. Uh, and of course he didn't. He really just seemed like he was replaying some of the classic hits of the 90s we heard some of those phrases, remember his talk about investment, right? we don't spend money on things, we invest. The image of the presidential election campaign as a job interview, and smart plans, uh, all of these are just tropes that we're very familiar with if you were following politics 20 or so years ago. And it, it seemed like he just sort of tried to reapply that same language, that same rubric, with some of the key buzzwords of this, you know, he was doing his part. He was playing his role, but with some of the key buzzwords of this campaign mixed in there, but basically just recycling Bill Clinton of old. Yeah, and I'm a little you know, sad for him because he, he almost plays the part of the corporate uh, consultant rather than the revered former president uh, here talking about the job as, as, as someone having a job interview and, and, and being able to, uh, to get the job right. Uh, the job should be leading a command center. Instead, what we've had is a storm center. Uh, and we don't want to renew this person's contract. So uh, very much consultant speak. Uh, it fits very well into this theme. Uh, if we only had a person who trusted the experts, when I was in office, I hired all the experts. They're still here. Go back to them and we'll be in good shape. But, but nothing of uh, 
of, of great inspiration that kind of drew yourself to a, a, a different picture of the country in, in Bill Clinton's speech. Right. And then we have the Jill Biden speech, uh, obviously introducing herself in some ways to the nation as, as first lady candidate, if you will, and using the classroom to do that, kind of get her story as, as a teacher, and then telling the story of her integration into the Biden family as, as Joe Biden's second wife, following the tragic death of his first wife and, and daughter. And, and so in introducing, using that to introduce this idea that, that you can make a family whole the same way that you make a nation whole. And this is part of a broader progressive argument that we should think about politics as people involved in a family. You know, government is what kind of binds the family together. Yeah. And if you, I think, read closer, there's an intellectual disconnect in, in making that argument. Uh, so we are to applaud, I think rightly, uh, Joe Biden returning home every night to Wilmington, Delaware, to put his sons to bed. That's not a government program that prompted him to go home every night. That was the responsibility that he had as a father to his two sons and his new wife. So those familial obligations that, that we fulfill, we don't do them out of some some reverence uh, for a government or some reverence for policies or programs. We, we do them uh, out of a true connection to that, which is our particular own. And I think that's, um, that's something that can't be um, replicated in a governmental structure over society. It, 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 we've seen the, the damage done when you try to make government uh, the, the, the parent uh, of the child, which is society. Uh, it, it, uh, it often subsumes the relationship that, that once was there within society. So anyway, I, I saw that yeah. disconnect there. Yeah, and you've got two very important spheres of life that are just distinct and have distinctive roles, the family and the government. And when we try to analogize them, then we sometimes lose the distinctive mandates that each has, both given by God. These are two God-given institutions, but for distinct purposes. Um, the other line that struck me that along those lines at the end of the speech was talking about trusting the nation to Joe. And again, there's just sort of this idea, first of all, of the president, right, as, as the one office holder who has responsibility for the whole nation, but then just handing over all of us somehow as, as a trust, as if, as if he's this father figure who's then meant to care for us all in the same way that he cared for Hunter and Bo and for Jill and those closely connected to him. All right, let's now shift our focus to Wednesday night. And we've got uh, several of the heavy hitters uh, Wednesday night. Hillary Clinton, of course, spoke, as did Elizabeth Warren, uh, Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, accepting the vice presidential nomination. Maybe just a few thoughts on, on these speeches. Uh, I think Hillary's speech was, again, kind of similar to her husband's in that there was, he sort of felt like we've been here before. Uh, then Elizabeth Warren, very diminished role, talking about child care and you know her f personal story in connection with that. And you know she was the other person besides Bernie Sanders who talked a little bit about specific plans in the area in that case of of child care. But but really brief speech. You, know, you thought about somebody that might have been vice presidential nominee and kind of gets pushed to the sidelines. Um, in even though she's got this primetime slot, it sort of felt like a much diminished role for her from what, what might have been. And then Barack Obama obviously comes up, second to last speech, longest speech of, of the evening, and really brings the kind of indictment, I think, that only an ex-president could against the sitting president. You're just not up to the job. I, I did the job well. I left things for you in a good condition, and you messed up. I would give a little more credence uh, to Elizabeth Warren's address. I, I think there was one line in her speech that stuck out to me, that in life she learned a fundamental truth that nobody makes it on their own. And I think that that line is kind of tied back to this notion that we were just discussing about uh, a government that empathizes with you, that you can't make it on your own, so you have to turn to government and will have to turn to Joe to hold the nation together to heal it and so on. And that we're gonna trust Joe and his team of empathizers, his team of planners, which works well, 
with Warren's, I've got a plan for that uh, to, to make the country uh, right again. So I, I likewise found uh, Hillary's speech to just lack any authenticity. I, th- I think that it's just amazing that time and time again, that uh, it just falls flat. And, and I don't think that's simply for me. I think that you know, many people hear the speech. And you know, after one uh, point, she said, I, I really wanted uh, the president or Donald Trump to, to, to do well. I meant that. Like she had to actually prove, right? That I really, right, really mean right. that. That I, I really wanted him to do well. Trust, <laughs> please trust me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm doth protest too much, but I think that that is is just clear in her speech. And I wasn't impressed with with President Obama's speech. And and, it, and, I, and but I just knew the next day when I woke up, it was going to be the, the best speech ever given. Given his oratory is amazing. If we just could get back to a time where he was there, and and I, I didn't I didn't sense that uh, from what I uh, read of, of his speech. I will say this, however, if you're looking at the kind of internet intellectual dynamics at play in the whole convention, and uh, the notions that we'll talk a little bit about later in the readings, required readings. I think you see a, a great cognizance of those readings and an intention in, in Obama's speech uh, that you might find lacking in other places. So, but that's that's how I'd make out Wednesday evening. Okay. Yeah. And of course, then we have the last speech of the night was the Kamala Harris acceptance speech. And as we said before, it was, wasn't really that attack dog speech that we anticipated as often we get from a vice presidential candidate, much more autobiographical. Uh, There was only one mention of Donald Trump and it really focused on, I think, connecting her story to the broader story of civil rights. Um, That seemed to be how she was trying to weave it all together. And then especially using the image of the beloved community, which was at least popularized by Martin Luther King Jr., in the 50s and early 60s, a number of speeches and writings, the idea of after nonviolent protest, what happens? Well, if you do it right, you actually bring about reconciliation. Yeah, and then that works into the most famous quote from her speech that there's no vaccine for racism. Well, that's very true. There's no uh, vaccine for racism, and uh, we don't need to read Shakespeare's Othello uh, to see that. Um, we don't need to see, uh, but we could, all of the ugliness through human history uh, that shows what racism is. But if, if that's part of that thing that is sown into human nature, is there a hope that somehow the Biden-Harris administration is going to, without finding a vaccine, find a means to work to undo racism forevermore? Uh, that's a that's a seminal challenge in every human age. Uh, we can't trust a series of experts to come up with something that's going to overcome that. That has to, I think, as you've just mentioned, be uh, an individual act produced by uh, teaching that individual, encouraging that individual to have the right character, but it's going to take that individual to do that individual forgiveness uh, on that particular basis. It's not going to be a government policy or a program that encourages that result. Yeah, so the last night of the convention, of course, we're just going to talk about the speech of uh, Joe Biden as he accepted the nomination. As we said last week, 32 years in the making. I've already congratulated Dave on his bingo. So he got Build Back Better and Unite. Uh, I only got one of my four words. I got decency. Uh, There was no literally incompetent or man, as in, oh, man, or come on, man. So let's, let's, let's deal with the substance of the argument. And we've already suggested that one of the, the key questions that he raises is what's, what's on the ballot. And one of the central passages of the speech, he says, characters on the ballot, compassion is on the ballot, decency, science, democracy, they're all on the ballot. Now, again, delivered in such a way that you sort of can take this all in. But if you really reflect on what he's saying, first of all, that to vote for Donald Trump is to be against all those things. And then there's this sort of awkward, implicit statement that I am the embodiment of those things. Right? But it for me means democracy and character and compassion and decency and science. I found the beginning of a speech to be interesting where he said that we just need to judge the president on the facts. However, when we review those facts, there's, there are quite a few issues with, with the facts as presented by the vice president. 5 million Americans infected with COVID-19. More than 170,000 Americans have died. By far the worst performance of any nation on earth. No, 
no, not true. Not, not true. But you can play with numbers, no matter how scientific you, you think you are. More than 50 million people have filed for unemployment this year. More than 10 million people are going to lose their health insurance this year. Nearly one in six small businesses have closed this year. Why has that happened? Has that happened because the president said, we have to close the economy? As the president said, I want people to lose their health insurance or I want small businesses to close. Hasn't there been a raging debate after, as to how open we want our states to be? Haven't we pointed fingers at those states that have opened their business faster? Haven't we suggested that somehow they're taking a risk with people's lives by catering more to the livelihood of constituents? So you can't have it, I think, both ways in, in this argument. You can't say on the one hand, I wanted to keep down infections as much as possible. And on the other hand, I wanted to keep businesses open because that certainly wasn't how the debate played out over the last six months, unless I was in some parallel universe <laughs> hearing something different. Am I, am I wrong there, Matt? No, I think that's a great point because they're trying to bring a double indictment against the president on this, that he botched the scientific side of the response to COVID-19 and therefore people have died in greater numbers than necessary, more people have been infected, et cetera. But also that the economy could have just kind of kept right on humming through this or didn't have to go down as badly. And, and obviously, all the remedies that have been proposed, just as you're saying, have been remedies that have made it impossible for the economy to function. No one can leave their house in various places. Well, there's some jobs you can plug away, you can keep going, but many, many jobs you can. And so the, the alternative narrative, right? I mean, sort of this broad, well, if we just done my plan, things would have been better. Well, you can say that, but, but exactly how would that have worked out? Right. And, you know, if you want to go back through the history, Trump is talking about how this isn't going to be a big deal in January. Well, you know, Democrats, including Joe Biden, were doing the same thing in their own ways. And we've, you know, no, no one had a perfect record in terms of knowing when to do what throughout this period. And just as you said, there's been this ongoing debate about how do you balance health versus the economy. And, and the whole idea has been that these two are in tension with each other. And by the way, on top of all this, the president's not running the show in any of this, right? It's, it's state governors who are making a lot of the decisions politically that have had the greatest impact on either the mortality rate, think about what happened in New York State because of the policies of Andrew Cuomo regarding nursing homes, or the economy. Uh, where states opened up early or they didn't open up and the various economic results that have followed from that. And, and Joe Biden being president wouldn't actually make him governor of all 50 states. So there would still be a problem there. The limits of the office, even if you had all the right things to say, you still would have only so many policy tools available to you as a leader who would be largely powerless in terms of the specific policies adopted by localities. That's just not a prerogative the president has. But you have to present it uh, if, if you're the president's opponent that this was a simple problem. It required a simple solution. And had that simple solution been enacted, we would not be here in August. And we know we all Americans who have lived through the last seven or eight months knows, know that there has been nothing simple about what's taken place the last seven months. In fact, there are a whole bunch of different complexities that have been accounted for. Uh, some have been accounted for right, some have been accounted for wrong. That's just the nature of human beings when they reflect upon any problem that they're faced with, social, political, or otherwise. I think we could all say that you could second guess decisions of every leader at every level. And if we could do it all over again, there would certainly be things that would be done otherwise. But that's not quite the same thing as saying, that if we had followed my path in real time, that the results would have been dramatically different. I think that's a much more difficult case to make. But of course, you can always talk that way because we don't have any real way of testing it. And if it's bad enough, people will say, well, it couldn't have been worse. We need to move on to our required reading. So Dave, what do you have for us today as we try to understand further the Democratic Party in 2020? Well, I do want to make mention before I get into the required reading, that, and I'm not charging anyone with plagiarism here, but I gave a convocation address at Providence on Tuesday evening. And the imagery that I used in that address was light and darkness. And then you turn to Vice President wow. Biden's speech. Where does he go? Light and darkness. Now, wow. Yep. I think there's something there. 
uh, there's a little uh, parallel happening here. Although I uh, presented light and darkness uh, <clears throat> a little bit differently uh, from a, a Christian perspective than the, the one that um, the vice president used in his speech. I would say, however, that there's a connection between how we understand light and darkness and, and our role in the world and what is um, hoped for as we see in the required readings, what, what human beings can, uh, can do, how they can make the world or how they think they can make the world uh, a better place and, and what this will take. And I think that there's been at least, um, uh, and, and some would argue further, they go back, uh, uh, people like Eric Vogelin go back to uh, the reality of Gnosticism in the Middle Ages and so on to kind of explain this, this modern uh, trend that uh, the problems of, of this world can be fixed. And we spoke a little bit about this last week as well, but I think in the, in the context of American history, it's really interesting to try to um, draw together what takes place after the founding so that the country pivots uh, in a more progressive uh, direction. And the way that I've always tried to, uh, to, to work through uh, this, this intellectual trajectory is by drawing the connection uh, between early American romanticism uh, and first off, its connection with pragmatism. Uh, secondly, the connection with uh, pragmatism and progressivism. And then finally, uh, between progressivism and the rise of, of the American administrative state. So uh, what I want to do with the required reading is I want to start with um, a passage from uh, William James, the great pragmatist, uh, not the father of pragmatism, but someone who comes um, uh, into the scene and, and kind of clarifies what pragmatism is at the beginning of the 20th century. I then want to turn from uh, James to uh, the great progressive uh, Herbert Crowley, uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, John Dewey, and then um, uh, end off by, by, by kind of examining the state of, of the Democratic Party and the progressive movement in the country today, and to kind of go back to our talk about the convention to, to see how well uh, this convention did in terms of kind of working through some of the hopes and aspirations of progressivism, uh, but doing so without um, producing distaste uh, for a certain class of people within the country. So let's start with James. And, and this is a set of lectures that he gives in 1907, um, all under the heading Prag Pragmatism, a new name for some old ways of thinking. So the, the context of these lectures is um, James is trying to suggest that uh, the pragmatic way to view the world uh, is, is a much clearer picture of reality than the older rationalist, traditionalist, or intellectualist way of looking at the world. And the best way that I can kind of uh, pare this down and, and, and make a clear sense of it is, is in the following way. If, if you are a pragmatist, you reject the older notion that somehow the subject as thinker about the world can look into the objective world and can find truth within the things of this world, can find absolute truth within the things of this world. The pragmatist says that there's no truth contained in the objective world. Truth is made by the subject. So something is only true if it makes a difference and it needs some initiation uh, or, or first impulse uh, to be able to make a difference. Now, I'll give you an example of that. I, this is the example I always think of when, when teaching James. We have this Declaration of Independence and we have this notion that all men are created equal. This objective truth, right, that all men are equal to the degree that they've been made human beings. The intellectualist or rationalist would say that the human being is equal in and of itself, kind of this Euclidean notion of equality, right? A thing that's equal to another thing is equal to itself. However, the pragmatist says that you can't really talk about a concept like equality and claim it to be true unless you have verified that it's true. So the only way you verify the truth of equality is by actually making things equal. Right? Equality is something that we produce. It's not something inherent in, in the nature of man. Now, I use the example of equality here because in, in tying together a pragmatic orientation of the world that, that gained strength in intellectual circles after the American Civil War uh, into the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you, you see that um, if you argue as James does that truth happens to an idea, 
it, it becomes true. It's made true by events. You could see how the, the pragmatic orientation to truth would lend itself to progressivism, lend itself to the idea that, okay, we can progress. We have to start making things happen. We have to start bringing into the world something effectual. We have to make the things that we believe true by making them true. And um, I don't think there's any better progressive who fairly describes where the country had been up until that point on truth and equality and democracy and the promise of American life uh, than uh, the, the father of progressivism, uh, Herbert Crowley, who writes this grand book uh, titled The Promise of American Life in 1909. Uh, the book is special for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one, I think Crowley does an amazing job uh, giving a fair accounting of, of the individuals who uh, had initiated uh, the American Republic in the first place and had guided it over its first 120 years. But he gets to a certain point in, in the book where he, he wants to encourage his fellow American to a, a higher American patriotism. Uh, he, he says that we need to have an imaginative projection of an ideal national promise. Now, Matt, when I say that, an imaginative projection of an ideal national promise, did you see that on display in this week's Democratic National Convention? I think that was one of the key themes. There was, in contrast to the more radical left that we're seeing in the streets in Portland, among other places, where it's basically burn it down and there's nothing redeemable in the American tradition. That wasn't the story. You had President Obama, for example, at the Constitution Museum with a little opening riff on the Constitution. And there was always the qualification, well, of course it wasn't perfect. Of course there were problems. Of course these groups weren't properly accounted for. But in the spirit of this, we move forward. In the spirit of of the ideals. Yeah, and it, it, it works in perfectly with where Curley goes in this, this essay. He says, the only fruitful promise of which the life of any individual or any nation can be possessed is a promise determined by an ideal. So it's a, it's a forward-looking ideal that you're moving toward. And, and you, you did see in President Obama's speech that we're, we're, we're heading towards this ideal, this North Star. And that's what we were trying to do when I was president. And that's what Joe will do again if you elect him in, in November. The problem, Crowley would say, is that as long as Americans believe they're able to fulfill their national promise simply by securing political rights, they will not aim and aspire towards that greater ideal. The problem, Crowley would say, with Americans of the 18th and 19th centuries is that they were too satisfied. They believed that in declaring independence and putting into place a federal constitution and trying to have a just administration of our affairs, a constitutional administration of our affairs, they believed that they had made it, that they had fulfilled the promise of democracy. But what um, Crowley says is that how can you say that the promise of democracy, that the promise of American life has been fulfilled if there are still radical differences between people, radical differences in, in, in what they're worth, radical differences in what their circumstances are? Uh, how can you say that we've fulfilled the promise of equality when we're living in a time where there's still a great amount of inequality? So note here for, for Crowley, as you said, he's going to build upon where we are, but have the idea of equality that is, that is actualized uh, by stamping out the inequality that, that exists in this world. So the, the progressive platform is put into place here at the beginning of the 20th century. What are we after? We're after putting into place an administrative state that can undo the injustices that are present within American society as long as inequality exists within American society. That's a, that's a massive project, but one that would truly uh, inspire people to do the right thing, to give them purpose uh, for their existence. So I, I, I do think that, that we see that um, in the DNC speeches, uh, this, this forward thinking progressivism that, that gives people a reason to be.
Yeah, Joe Biden's word was possibilities, but I think it captures the same idea that is embedded here that uh, all, all is possible. You can achieve things that haven't been achieved um, and these promises can be unpacked and further realized over time. So what could be wrong with this dream of things? What could be wrong with this progressive vision of fulfilling the promise of American life? Well, here's another great aspect of of Crowley's thought. He, He recognizes what he's up against. He's up against an American mindset in which we as individuals want to believe that we're successful because we made the right choices. We did the right things. We, uh, we uh, developed our character. And Crowley says that as long as that is present within your mindset, you may be satisfied with achieving something on your own and not wanting kind of this greater national or collective ideal. So Crowley has this very interesting statement after he puts forward this progressive ideal. The chance which the individual has to compete with his fellows and take a prize in the race is vitally affected by material conditions over which he has no control. It is as if the competitor in a marathon cross-country run were denied proper nourishment or proper training and was obliged to toe the mark against rivals who had every benefit of food and discipline. Under such conditions, he is not as badly off as he as if he were entirely excluded from the race. With the aid of exceptional strength and intelligence, he may overcome the odds against him and win out. Here the key quote. But it would be absurd to claim, because all the rivals towed the same mark, that a man's victory or defeat depended exclusively on his own efforts. So here really is the, um, the juxtaposition for the progressive. We as individuals tend to want to think that we're successful because we did the right thing as individuals. The progressive wants us to aim towards a progressive ideal. What's it going to require for us to get to that progressive ideal? We're going to have to, we're going to, have to give up on the pride that we have in our individual circumstance, our individual na- nat- nature, and our individual uh, exertion. Uh, only by doing that uh, will, uh, will we be able to move forward and, and fulfill uh, the promise of our society. And, you know, I think there's, there's something to that in the year 2020, right? When you look at Americans today, uh, how many of us as Americans, when our, our children go off to college, uh, want to pat ourselves on the back for the good job that we've done as individuals? Uh, how many of us uh, really get some sense of, of, of pleasure and, and fulfillment uh, by thinking through our lives and, and, and kind of patting ourselves on the back uh, for, for who we are? I mean, you, when, you, when you look at the Oval Office today and, and you look at um, President Trump, probably the thing that annoys most people about him is he's so exclusively bent on making the claim that he as an individual has done X, Y, and Z. So uh, in, in many ways, Trump is, is kind of uh, rightfully considered to be a progressive nightmare. What would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where what Crowley is really doing is redefining for us the idea of equality of opportunity. And so often people think about, well, I'm, I'm for equal opportunity, but not equal results. Uh, but what Crowley says, well, if you really mean equality of opportunity, then let's think about that more fully. Because if you think about this marathon image, or I think about it in class, sometimes I use like the image of a 100 meter race, right? 100 meter race in the Olympics is my favorite event. I mean, it's just pure speed. It's just human excellence. It's amazing. And when you get down to the finals for that, I mean, you've got the 10 fastest people or eight fastest people in the world. And, you know, you fire that gun, whoever crosses the finish line first gets the gold medal, no questions asked. And if you imagine a different race where you've got, you know, Usain Bolt, and then you've got, um, you know, an 80-year-old man with a walker and a three-year-old child. And, you know, you sort of multiply the different range of options there and you say, okay, fire the gun. Let's see how it goes. Well, it becomes absurd, right? It doesn't, it no longer really seems like a, a contest you'd want to cheer for. You'd, you'd want to applaud. It doesn't, doesn't elevate. And you, you sort of think, well, this isn't, this isn't a fair race. And so that's the kind of argument that he's making there. And, you know, this has a long history that goes along with it. Um, you know, John Rawls picks up on this uh, 50 years, 60 years later, and really wants to argue that all of the qualities that we have are essentially arbitrary. Now, there's a Christian version of this, right, where you say, no, they're gifts from God. But the, the secular progressive version is they're entirely arbitrary. And so you have no claim based upon whatever 
qualities of character you have or the circumstances. You know, today we use the word privilege, right? The privileges you've been given. All those things are entirely arbitrary from a moral standpoint. And so if, if you're doing well, well, it's probably because of all the different things you were given, not the things that you actually earned. Correct. So Crowley closes the, the book and, and it establishes the remedy by suggesting what? How are we going to be able to overcome the natural disadvantage of our gifts? How are we going to be able to overcome the circumstantial uh, disadvantage of the context in which we grow up in? And the only way that we can do that, Crowley argues, is if we have a very powerful interventionist state that actually takes the side of those least advantaged within society. So it's equal opportunity plus. Uh, it's, it's a constant uh, remedying of, of any inequality uh, that, that comes into existence. And, and this, I think, has been a lot of what we've seen in 20th century American public policy, uh, this intervention at play, uh, this, um, this trying to kind of uh, equalize things wherever you can. Not a, not a perfect equality, not a Marxism, uh, because there's had there there has to be been a a compromise struck between that that idea of uh, America the American individual and the progressive ideal. So I think the best democratic politicians have been able to sell progressivism without upsetting uh, those of an individualistic orientation. Which is why I want to turn uh, in my third uh, reading, which is very very short. Uh, it's a passage from Paul Johnson's. A great book, Modern Times, a chapter titled The Last Arcadia, in which um, he references, uh, Johnson references the philosopher John Dewey and John Dewey's warning to his fellow East Coast uh, uh, progressive elites. He says, don't leave behind middle America because much of middle America is essential to the progressive project. Quote, the church-going classes, those who have come under the influence of evangelical Christianity, these people form the backbone of philanthropic social interest, of social reform through political action, a pacifism of popular education. They embody and express the spirit of kindly goodwill toward classes which are at an economic disadvantage and towards other nations, especially when the latter show any disposition toward a Republican form of government. The Middle West, the prairie country, has been the center of active social philanthropy and political progressivism because it's the chief home of this folk. So th this middle America that, that Dewey points to as being essential to, to actualizing the progressive dream, uh, they must be brought into the fold. If, 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 if middle America views itself as outside right, the progressive norm uh, or views progressive norms as being antagonistic, to what it believes in, then, then that East Coast cosmopolitanism is going to create a rift uh, between the uh, Democratic Party and the country, between the progressive movement and the country. So how would you judge, Matt, how well uh, a candidate, Democratic candidate for president, um, but former Vice President Joe Biden, and all others who spoke Monday through Thursday on this account, did they heed Dewey's warning well or, or not? Well, I think they did, and in part because they learned or are learning from the experience of 2016. So Hillary Clinton's narrative about 2016 is that the election was stolen or the Russians took it or whatever. But the Democratic Party more broadly has essentially attributed, I think, to two things, neglect of the Midwest and a general lack of effort getting out the vote. And there was an effort to connect that to the problems of middle America. And so you saw images of farmers and you talk about factory workers, lots of emphasis on saving the auto industry, going back to the Obama administration and the reaction to the Great Recession. So that was clearly about Michigan, that was about Wisconsin, that was about some of these key battleground states that were neglected by Hillary Clinton in 2016, not going to make that mistake twice. Yeah, and I, I think that um, the the best uh, best piece I saw covering this week kind of hit upon uh, this point as well that that um, that Joe Biden did did a good job uh, in in his uh, nomination speech. Uh, he rightly said that while he's a proud Democrat, he'll be an American president. 
Uh, but this examiner piece also mentioned, well, uh, if that's the rhetoric of the convention, but those aren't going to be the policies that you pursue as president, at what point uh, will the policies you, you pursue upset that portion of middle America? And what it made me think of, the, the, the one scene that I thought was um, most poorly done uh, in, in the whole convention was placing Jill Biden in the empty classroom and, and suggesting to us that we ought to be empathizing with the teachers who no longer can teach the children in the school. Uh, when in reality, I think a lot of empathy <laughs> It should be showered upon the parent or parents who are trying to make ends meet right now and who are having to school their own children and still have to pay a great level of taxation in order to pay for an educational system uh, that is is very inadequate uh, when you're doing it online. But then my second note, and, and I may have nothing to, to this point, but but one of the problems I see with the Midwest strategy, especially with policy, is the following. What's not going to happen this fall in Ohio and in Michigan and in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, that is very important to the people of Ohio and Michigan, Minnesota? No football. There you go. <laughs> that, is a, that is part of the norms of fall in these states. And that may be something that as we move closer and closer to the election, if that point is, is emphasized, that may be a point where the tension becomes very real between the rhetoric of the convention and the reality of life uh, under what might be the next de Democratic administration. Do you want to live uh, or do you want to defer to an empathetic government that does not allow you to live? Right. And I think the other policies part of that is going to be the way that the Green New Deal or the climate change type of programs get translated into policy, because I think there's real questions about whether Western Pennsylvania is going to get on board with the Joe Biden campaign once some of those policy specifics start to get out there. And you think of other parts of the, the Midwest as well that have um, deep connections to non-renewable sources of energy. So, yeah, I think there's a, a rhetorical strategy here that was effectively carried out, the question is, will the policies match that and can that be kept up through this fall campaign season? All right, well, that means it's time for us to open the grade book. And today we're going to take a look at some of these new traditions that may have been launched by this first online, virtual, whatever you want to call it, national convention. So, you know, they had a Reimagine this whole thing without the throngs, without the crazy hats, without the confetti and the bands and all the rest, and a lot of production effort that went into that. So I want to talk about three of the things that were leading trends, it seemed like, in the way they were trying to execute this and see what we thought of those. So number one, at the end of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden's speeches, obviously there's no big crowd to erupt into applause, but they had these kind of walls of people on zoom and they all start clapping it's you can tell it's a little bit awkward because they're just clapping on their couch in their living room really loudly and they probably can't see everybody else i'm not sure what you know what, what they're looking at but and then meanwhile you've got on stage right there's joe biden or there's kamala harris trying to do their thing where they kind of clap back at people or they wave or they they do that point the finger at somebody in the crowd and oh yeah smile hey there's bill you know, whatever that. So, you know, virtual crowds, right? What, what do you make of the virtual crowd? Do you, do you do the Zoom thing? Do you, is, do you have to have a crowd? Or if you can't have real people there in person, do you just let it go? What do you think, Dave? What, what would you grade the, the Zoom wall of supporters? I'd grade that a D. I, I've seen some concerts over the summer that have been Zoomed where there are is a performer who's just outstanding and the people who are watching are kind of moved by the music and react. And it's just much, much more natural. And I think, you know, part of, um, uh, part of stagecraft and politics today is so artificial anyway, that it just seems that much more artificial when you're bringing in uh, this other uh, virtual uh, uh, audience. So I, I give that a, a low D. Yeah, I, I agree. I just, I didn't think it really worked. There weren't enough people, so it, it felt like a very small crowd and everyone, everyone on both sides of it just felt like they didn't 
quite know what they were supposed to do. I would say that the Republicans should try something else. Uh, either have a small crowd of people that are actually there, socially distanced, whatever you got to do, or, or just not have that applause thing at the end of the speeches. Fortunately, as teachers, we don't have to worry about getting applause from the <laughs> Zoom right. discussions we're having, right? It's just, we just want, you know, to see people awake yeah, on the other side open, of things. Right. And then we can point at them. Yay, you're awake. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> Got 17 people awake, three asleep. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Batting 85%. That's right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's right. That's a pretty good morning. Okay. All right. Now, number two, we've got the award show type hosts. So each night you had a different Hollywood actress who kind of hosted the primetime thing, did the transitions between speeches, depending on who they were, threw in a few jokes or you know, comments, political comments. Is this something that the Republican convention should be looking to emulate? Kind of depends for me, like who, who are you going to invite for hosts? I mean, do you have people who are actually funny? Do you have people who yeah. you want to see? Uh, I mean, the most of the people that um, that were there this week are not really individuals that I'm drawn to. So uh, I, I don't know. I, maybe it works, you know, if, if you know these people and admire them, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a C in my case because there's nothing there for me. Yeah, I, I thought it was it was awkward. You know, these are great actresses, but it still wasn't a great format for them. I'm not really into the whole award show scene as it is. Uh, Republicans, I would say, definitely steer clear of this because, you know, we, we know the, the list of actors that are available for a Republican convention. And so... It's on it's, one hand, really. It's, so Right. Yeah. So they all made that movie a few years ago. And, <laughs> you know, they're all kind of known within some small circles. But you know, I, I'm not sure that's going to be your most effective. Maybe some country music stars. I, I don't know who you've got, you know, in your Rolodex, but it's not the same A-listers that the Democrats have available to them. But I, I do on that point want to um, just note that you just said Eva Longoria was a great actress. So I want to make sure that, <laughs> that we have you on record having stated that, that you, you had mentioned that and she was one of the hosts. So. Okay, uh, well... Okay. Maybe I should qualify my remarks. That, <laughs> to be honest, I don't think I've seen any of them, but uh, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, of course, and yes, many she's, Seinfeld episodes. She, but She's very good. But the other three, I don't think I've seen any significant body of their work. But I'm, I'm trusting that they made choices among the, the many talented actors and actresses that they had available to them who would have no doubt been willing to, to take on this task. It was amazing. We we didn't know before this convention that Hollywood was was um, in favor of the Democratic Party. Uh, that's, yeah, that, that's just a great. That was weird, wasn't it? <laughs> epiphany. That's right. <laughs> All right. So I think we've graded that one low as well. We've got one last the uh, speech backdrop metaphors. That's the best way I can capture this. So of course the number one of, in all this was John Kasich standing at the crossroads. Literally, Joe Biden didn't need to use the word literally because John Kasich had already killed it on the very first night of, of the convention. This is a dividing road we must choose. And then he stood in the middle. So I don't even know what, what did that mean exactly, right? He didn't actually choose one direction or the other. But that, that was one metaphor that was difficult to miss. You had the Bernie Sanders woodpile. So we mentioned that already. And then Chuck Schumer giving his speech at least – if we took him at his word in front of the Statue of Liberty, unfortunately it was dark. I don't know. Others maybe had a, had a better channel they were watching, but I couldn't see the Statue of Liberty. It just looked like black sky behind him to me. So I, you know, it was definitely meant to make a point and Schumer's speech really depended upon the metaphor, but unfortunately there was no Statue of Liberty visible at nine or nine thirty at night on the East coast. So what do you think speech, backdrop metaphors. Should we go heavy into this uh, if you're an advisor to the Republican Party next week? No, I probably wouldn't go there. Uh, I, I would give that, I give it a kind of a high grade because it was funny. And when, when yeah. people think that they have to make an idea so explicit to someone that, <laughs> right. that, that the metaphor is so front and center, but I, I would probably uh, not go in that direction. So uh, for enjoyment, I'd give, give those an A minus. Um, as a consultant, I'd give those a D minus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was fun, but not, not a good way to go. I think, I, I mean, the Bernie Sanders one, I, I enjoy just because you don't really know what the metaphor was. 
which was kind of fun. Like, why, why are we standing in front of a wood pile? But, so, so I like the mystery embedded in that one. It wasn't quite as hitch over the head as, as Kasich or Schumer. But um, even throw them all together, I'm still going to have to give it a, a, a C minus, I think. All right. Well, we're down to the last segment of the show, to Tocqueville's Crystal Ball. Um, last week's predictions, we've already kind of updated each of those. Dave aced uh, the Joe Biden speech. That was probably the most impressive performance based on the questions that we had last time. The convention lineup isn't exactly set just yet. We know that President Trump, of course, will speak on Thursday night and Vice President Pence Wednesday night and Melania Trump on Tuesday night. But rather than going through night by night the way we did last time, we're going to just do some broader questions on the Republican convention. So here's the first question. How many different Trumps or Trumps in law will give a speech, Dave? Wow. How many are there? I think I've, I've called with eight that, that seem like they're possibilities. I, I'm going to say like five of them are dead cert, but the other three possibly. I <clears throat> so I, I'd say everyone but Barron. Barron's what, 14 years old? 14, yeah. He's you know, maybe like six months shy of being included. So I'll, I'll go with seven. I'll, I'll, okay. Everyone but Barron. Okay, so that's Donald Trump, of course, Melania, Eric, Donald Jr., Ivanka. Then you've got Tiffany, who spoke last time. I'd forgotten that. And then Jared Kushner, who I don't think did speak last time, but you know, he's coming off his Middle East peacemaking uh, success. So it wouldn't surprise me if they bring him out to speak uh, about that. So you're saying seven, not, not Barron. I'm going to say they do the whole eight. I'm going to say mm-hmm. Barron's going to have some small role but they're going to bring him out there. Maybe he'll nominate his dad or, you know, he'll do something that'll bring him into the ceremony just a little bit. Note here what's happened. The, the Democratic Party, as we saw this week, we wanted to make government your family. <laughs> Donald Trump wants to make government his family. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We're setting up the dynasty. Good. Okay. If the Clintons can do it, the Bushes can do it. Why not the Trumps? All right. Second question. Which of the following words will be in the New York? New York Times or Washington Post headline of the article covering Donald Trump's acceptance speech. Okay, so which of the following words will be in that headline, either the Washington Post or New York Times? Here's your choices. Combative, divisive, blasts, attacks, hits, dark, and base. I'm gonna just have to try this with all these words. Playing to his base, President Trump made dark attacks in a combative and divisive manner <laughs> against the Democratic Party. I think I got six of those there. Maybe that's not. Pretty good. I don't know if that's a headline. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> right. Might be your first sentence. Sure. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, you have the list right there. But uh, you know, at least four of them uh, will be will be in that headline. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna single out. I think combative. They they, they like they, they like combative because it's negative, but not super partisan negative. You can sort of get away with it as the paper of record, where democracy avoids the darkness. I think we're going to get dark though. There's been a lot of references to him being dark, and of course that would be a nice nod to the Biden imagery. And then I'm going to say. Uh, attacks. I'm going to say combative attacks and dark are the three, the three words there. Okay. So then we've got to do our equivalent of our bingo board from last time. Give me four words that aren't part of the convention theme or the official thanks, thanks, slogan. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to have a chance to win this time. Sure. Okay. So four words that aren't a part of the official theme or slogan that will appear in Donald Trump's acceptance speech. Now, one further twist, and one word we might expect to be there but won't. All right, so my four are mob, lawless, hate, radical. Okay. One word that, that you expect to be there that, that won't. Hmm. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what mine are while you think about that. Okay. Okay. I've got anarchists, so that's going to be kind of play off your mob. Protect, protect from the lawless. Mars, I think he's going to talk about Mars. I think there's going to be something about like that's, everyone says there's no agenda for the second term. I think Mars is going to be that agenda, part of that agenda. And then stock market, he loves to talk about the stock market. 
Um, and the word that he's not going to mention that we're going to expect him to mention based on last campaign is wall. I think we're going to lay off the wall. Not a lot of walls been built and I'm sure he's not going to want to draw attention to that fact. Yeah, I like that. I, so I, I, I made me think I, maybe the word that I would leave out is immigrant. So immigrant won't, won't, won't make its way into his speech. Okay. All right. Well, we will see. We, we did okay, I think, with our predictions last time, but we've got some work to do. Our crystal ball predictions are not perhaps the most accurate part of the show, but maybe the most fun anyway, at least for us. So that's going to wrap it up for this week. Thanks, as always, for listening. And we'll be back with you, Lord Willie, next week, talking about the Republican National Convention. In the meantime, please remember to subscribe and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to connect with us on Instagram at Democracy in America Today. Thanks again. We look forward to talking to you next week.